afternoon. Uh, this is Doug Richard broadcasting live from School for Startups in London. I love saying that. Yeah, it makes me sound like I'm on the BBC. Um, I am here with five entrepreneurs from around the world. And we're going to talk. This is the second in a series of um, broadcasts leading up to One Young World coming in October from Johannesburg, where we will be. And what we're doing is we're trying to lend some practical uh, tools and tricks to people who are engaged in the starting and growing of social enterprises. So the financing of a social enterprise, given the fact that a social enterprise is at heart a business that makes what's known as a subrogated return or a lesser return, it is in, in its core a business. Therefore it creates revenue and it creates a form of profit. The reason I say a form of profit is because the word profit is generally reserved for money that is then dis uh, distributed to shareholders through dividends. And of course the point of a social enterprise is that you don't distribute the share dividends to shareholders, rather those monies are repurposed for some social goal. Therefore it is generally understood that a social enterprise basically serves two bottom lines. It serves the bottom line of creating a profit or a surplus, which is the general term used, and also solving a social problem and you want to measure the ability of the social enterprise to solve that social problem. Because obviously if it's ineffective at doing the social good, then it's ineffective in one of its two core missions. The great potential advantage of a social enterprise, of course, is that unlike a charity, it's not dependent on the goodwill and the charitable giving of others. It's a machine that can create its own revenue and therefore create the funding it needs to solve social problems. The challenge of a social enterprise is at heart though it's still a business and therefore it may have costs. It will certainly have operating costs and operating costs can frequently be man managed by operating revenues. But it may also have capital or startup costs. And if you're ambitious and you want to create a very large or very uh, growing or scaling social enterprise, you have the secondary issue of needing growth capital. The reason startup capital and growth capital are such an issue for social enterprises is that the traditional means by which you raise that kind of money through venture capital or investment are generally not open to a social enterprise because a typical investor is not interested in getting putting money into a company that will never return the money to it. Thus if you're going to ha if we are going to have social enterprises we are also going to need social capital. Social capital, like a social enterprise, is a new beast in the world. And there are efforts to, at hand around the world to create different forms of social capital. Some of it is equity capital and some of it is debt capital. The debt capital, um, the most recent evidence is both in the UK and Australia of social bonds. And in the UK in particular, there's social investment capital, although that's appearing in other countries of the world for equity investment. A very good friend of mine runs the largest uh, social venture capital fund in the world here in London called Bridges Ventures which actually puts capital into social enterprises as an investment. Now how they do that is an interesting story because it lends some understanding of how social enterprises may have a way forward from getting investment capital. Part of the challenge here is understanding this notion of social return and patient capital. Social capital or patient capital does not say that they never make money on their money. It says that they make less money on their money. And that's a very important distinction because there are people who believe that if you're going to put money into a social enterprise, you as the person putting the money in should never get any money back. Now that's a challenge. It's a challenge because essentially that's not an investment, period. That's another form of charitable giving. And though there's nothing wrong with charitable giving, grants and endowments, endowments exist through charitable enterprises to support good works. It doesn't line up with the notion of creating a replenishable fund that can then take that capital and put it to work. It's not really lining up with the notion of a social enterprise as a business. But let me give you a for example. If tomorrow I were to take all the money, let's say I was a, I don't know, let's say I was a multi-billionaire who had created had ten billion dollars in my pocket and I put that ten billion dollars into a charity and I then decide to take all the interest income off that charity and to spend it. Now let's say I decided that I couldn't because I only owned half that money and so I took my half the money of the interest I made on my half and I spent it on good works but say my brother or sister decided to keep the money for themselves. Nobody would dispute 
that the money that I've given away is any less good just because money that's also attached to that capital is not given away. We're not compromising the quality of our social work just because all of the money that that capital produces doesn't go to us. So too the case, if somebody steps up tomorrow, a large insurance company or a large corporation and says, we're going to take this money that we could have earned, and I'll make up some numbers, 10% interest on for the next 10 years. And we're going to give it to you, and we're going to put it into your business, and we're going to ask for 5% on our money. It would be illogical and also simply untrue to deny that we have been given a gift of 5% of that capital. Period. We essentially are paying less than the commercial rate for money that other people would have earned more on. It is no different than them earning the money and then just giving us money as a gift because it comes to precisely the same outcome. The reason this distinction is important is because by appreciating that capital can earn less rather than none, we open the door for new and novel ways of investing in social enterprises. So for example, in a social entrepreneurial situation, a social venture fund can put some money into a social enterprise and say, we don't intend to make as much money as we would have normally made. We're going to make less. And therefore, we're gifting you some of the money we would have otherwise made. Why is that important? Well, because that way, you now have extra money to use towards the social purpose. And there should be some relationship between the cost of the social purpose and the reduction in the cost of the money. This is the heart of how social venture capital works. Now, there's lots of ways for a company to start a social enterprise and the seed capital for social enterprises frequently comes from charitable institutions or governments making grants and that's true in every country of the world and that's great you know I, it's my view that if somebody wants to give you free money you should smile shake their hand and take their money because there's nothing wrong with free money but we can't depend upon it what we need to do is we need to start thinking about the world as less a question of depending on people's moral behavior and more depending upon building ongoing systems and structures that permit these things to grow by themselves without depending upon goodwill or charity. Goodwill or charity is wonderful, but it's not dependable. It comes and it goes. But if, in fact, we're starting businesses and these businesses will get onto their own feet it seems to me perfectly logical that we should return the capital to the people who gave us so they can go on to do the next good thing. We are now a freestanding business doing well and doing good, and now so they can take that capital and put it to somebody else to do well and do good with. And if we get our head around that, then we're creating a virtuous circle that will lead to more social enterprise and the scaling of social business, which is as long a narrative as I'm going to give today on the question of social enterprise finance. And instead, we're going to turn it around. I'm going to let you guys ask me the most difficult questions you can. And I think we will start with Catherine, since you're first in line on my screen. So we want to bring Catherine up, guys. Catherine, hello. Hello. Um, well, I'm Catherine Kipsang, and I'm Kenyan. And I'm actually running a civic startup called Politic.com. And our two main aims are to provide the public with key information about their politicians that they need when they go to the ballot box to vote and to also provide a platform for politicians and the public to interact. And um, do you want me to ask you a question or let everyone else introduce themselves? I think we're going to let everyone introduce themselves and I'm going to come back okay. to you, Catherine. You're going to step up and ask the first question. So who's up next? Bring her up. Ah, Clara. Hello. Hello. Do you want to introduce yourself to the audience? Ah, yes. So I'm Clara Manua. I'm from Zimbabwe. And I'm running a startup called Easby. And Easby is an online incubator for businesses and uh, young African leaders. So we're really trying to bring together the African community to learn to work together. And we're building that community online through our platform. Thank you, Clara. Uh, next up, I think, is Francisco. Oh, it's Matthew. Sorry, Matthew. Go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Matt Fitzpatrick, and I'm from Sydney, Australia. And I founded a charitable managed fund called Investing for Charity. And this is something where uh, we raise donations from the public. Uh, we can invest those funds, like a managed fund invests those funds, generate a return, hopefully more than 5%, and then we donate 5% every year to charities. Excellent. Next up is either Tsidiso or... Ah, Tsidiso. Hello. 
Hello, <clears throat> my name is Elisa. I'm from Johannesburg, South Africa. Um, my business is actually called Change SA. Uh, it's a non-profit company where we intend on taking kids from rural South Africa and we place them in, in very good high quality schools. And what we also do is, like Matthew, we uh, receive funding uh, from external donors, and that money is used and is invested. And, that, uh, and the idea behind that is that, in the long run, we would be self-sustaining. We wouldn't actually require funding from, other, from external parties. And last but not least is Francisco. All right. Um, hi, my name is Francisco Abad from Ecuador. I am 22 years old, and I'm the founder of a social startup called Social Media for Change. And we try to we are trying to produce multilingual educational social media content to teach on democracy, human rights, entrepreneurship, and environment. And we want to finance it through the YouTube Partner Program and other ways to monetize um, social media uh, to integrate it with education and use this profit to adapt the content and bring it to communities without internet. You've got that pitch down, don't you, Francisco? <laughs> 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 right. Let's go back to Catherine. Okay, so Catherine, my first, uh, yeah, my first question has to do with what you were saying about um, when investors invest in a social enterprise, they need to understand that they might earn less than what they invested. And my question is, do you, are there social enterprises out there that actually earn more than um, that an investor can earn more than what he invested, and would that still be considered a social enterprise? Okay, so. You, the distinction we're drawing, obviously, is between the return of capital and then earning income on that capital. And the answer is, by definition, yes. So the largest social enterprise venture fund that I'm familiar with is Bridges Ventures. They've raised some 15 or 18 million pounds sterling. And they explicitly look to put money into social enterprises that don't just return capital, but return capital plus something greater than the capital invested. And by definition, because the amount that they get back is less than they would have gotten back on a commercial return basis, okay. they are contributing a portion of their profit or potential profit. Now, sometimes that shows itself in some very funny ways. So, for example, sometimes they will put money into an organization with the expectation, believe it or not, that that organization will create something that's for sale at a later date. So it will create an intellectual property asset of value. In that case, they're looking for an equity return. And the way they show their social goals then is to take less equity than they would have normally taken and thus curtail the return. It's just a slightly more nuanced uh, version. I think, Matthew, isn't the entire point of your social enterprise fund to basically make money and give money away? Yeah. So you largely represent an entity that would sort of fits this model, no? Yeah. So you try and make more money than you would give away every year. That would like be a good year idea. Year. Yeah. Because <laughs> if you make less than you give away every year, there's a, you run out of business. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you have to go back to fundraising. <laughs> yeah. I've done those too, you know. Yeah. Um, right. Uh, next up for a question is Clara. Yep. So... Um, with ESB, we, we're trying to connect young entrepreneurs, and not just connect them, but to also learn about their businesses and help them to create sustainable businesses. And most of the people come from the southern African region, and you do know what has happened to Zimbabwe now, because most of our young people come from Zimbabwe, and they have very brilliant ideas. But the biggest question comes, how do I secure finances in such a volatile env uh, political um, environment? Because we, we have a platform with a lot of startups and we hold forums, we've held conferences, and at the end of the day, we walk away and we give them a badge and say, okay, we want to see this project happen. They come back to us and they say, we're not getting finances because of our environment. So how do you make sure that even though you're in this sort of environment that you can still manage to create an element of trust and get your startup finances? All right, so you did I did ask for hard questions, so congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because there's a number of elements to this and you know, I think you were very polite in how you described the situation in Zimbabwe. Um, which is fine, 
Um, but it does highlight the fact, and it's not just a Zimbabwe situation, is yeah. fairness. Um, there, you're not in the only uh, volatile environment. But there are Absolutely. two elements to volatility, and only one of them is solved with trust. One element of volatility is the inherent uncertainty of any enterprise starting in a place like Zimbabwe, where you've got what can only be described as an uncertain application of the law. It's not evenly applied to various entities. It really depends on where you are and who you know. Mm -hmm. And that's a challenge. So that's one element of uncertainty. There's another type of uncertainty, which has to do with currency uncertainty. As you know, the currency of Zimbabwe is fragilely related to the rest of the world's currencies. Um, mm -hmm. See, that was me being polite. And <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. And, but that's a real challenge, and that you're not yeah. the only country that has that issue. There's lots of people in lots of countries. I mean, I did work in Nigeria last year, which doesn't actually mm -hmm. have the same level of volatility as Zimbabwe, not in terms of political uncertainty. But it has two other forms of uncertainty. It's got, well, it's got one of the shares. It's got currency uncertainty. So we actually couldn't use Western credit cards or banks or anything because Nigeria is notorious for being challenging um, in terms of bank transfers. Mm -hmm. And so we actually had to bring wadges of cash down that was turned into local cash just so we could pay people, our local staff. So there's a real currency issue that gets in the way of bringing money into and deploying effectively in some mm -hmm. countries. And of course in Nigeria you have a th another type of uncertainty and that's what I would call security risk. And that is just the deployment of people in places where they may or may not be wanted. And thus you have sort of a different type of risk. The reason I bring them up is each type of risk is addressed differently. Mm -hmm. Thus when you talk about currency risk, we did manage to get around it. And so we created a sort of an entity inside the country and we transferred the money to the entity in the country and then that money was immediately taken out of that as cash and then that cash was carefully distributed to various parties. So you can deal with things as simple as currency. What you're asking though is the hardest question and that is if you've got somebody sitting in Zurich in this lovely safe building and they're looking out across the world and you say, I've got this wonderful social enterprise in Harare. Mm -hmm. And they go, hmm, I wonder where Harare is. And they look it up on a map and they go, ooh, Zimbabwe. Mugabe. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And so what you've got, of course, is you've got what amounts to political fear. And that is that people are afraid that they send the money to anything in Zimbabwe and who knows what will happen. So there's two different ways to deal with this. The first is your organization has to set itself out as credible, independent of the country in which it's operating. Therefore, you have to adhere to a series of international standards. No matter how small you are, you have to right up front say, we're going to adhere to the following global standards for audit. We're going to be running our stuff in this way. If you're allowed to legally, it's good to run, and some countries permit it, some don't, run your bank accounts in third-party countries. Right? So some, for example, I know a number of social enterprises that operate in volatile places that have set their quote-unquote company up in Ireland because Ireland is a largely viewed as a completely benign nation. It's not politically problematic like the UK and the US, but it's largely a safe banking environment, as safe as anywhere is these days. And therefore, by setting themselves up there, and these are some small organizations. Now, in some instances, as a national of a country, you're actually not allowed to do that. You'd actually be prohibited from running the outside bank accounts because the government would think you were messing around with money. Yeah. So in some instances, trust becomes a question of how can you find somebody in another country that you can get personal engagement with, but you have to hold yourself to international accounting standards. You have to present yourself as a citizen of the world. It's, it's just a simply a large challenge. I am currently, for example, investing incredibly small amounts of money into a social enterprise in Bucharest, in Romania. Now, I have had huge challenges in Romania. We ran a program there, and it was problematic. And a lot of the money that should have been going to one place just didn't get there. Nevertheless, I trust these people, and in their case, Clara, I know them. I met them while I was teaching there, so a personal level of trust developed that permitted me to think, fine, School for Startups will put a bit of money into them because we want to see them succeed, and it's not a lot of money, but it's still the core uncertainties are there, aren't they? Mm -hmm. 
And even though most people don't think of Romania as risky, it is. It turns out to be very risky. <laughs> um, so I don't have simple answers. I think you either have to develop personal relationships or you have to become an ambassador for your enterprise and develop personal relationships that essentially surmount the inherent risk of working in places like, you know, Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. Need to know people, yeah. Yes. Was that your short <laughs> version of the answer? You need to know people. <laughs> <laughs> so, Doug, you didn't have to say all that shit. You just have to say you need to know people. <laughs> no, no. Uh, right. Uh, the next up on my screen looks like it's Francisco. Okay, sorry. I, yeah, I was, I was muted. Um, no was, worries. <laughs> so... <laughs> My uh, my question is the following, and I've written it down because I don't want to miss details. Uh, let's say you're a social, let's say a social entrepreneur is about to pitch his business to you for investment. What are the main things you're looking to hear and like about the pitch in order to give him the investment? And do you look do you look more at the idea or the business? I mean, at the idea of the business or the team? And would you uh, give us the main pointers to help social entrepreneurs pitch? their social business in the most effective way to persuade social investors? Okay, it's a really good question, Francisco. Um, it's a, not the fastest answer, so let me sort of work through it. Um, you ask, is it more the idea or the team? Uh, they're, they're, I treat them very differently. A bad idea will lose an investment. A good idea will not get one. A good team will get an investment a bad team will not necessarily lose it. And so what you have to understand is one is a positive that you create, one's a negative that you avoid. And so I usually, most people will look at the idea first, because if the idea can't succeed, then no team will make it succeed. The problem is I have seen many quite modest ideas made effective by great teams. But no team is better than a bad idea. And therefore, no matter how good you are, if the thing can't work, you can't, you know, they say you can't put lipstick on a pig. Well, you know, <laughs> if it starts ugly, it's going to end up pretty ugly. Um, and that's kind of, that's probably a poor metaphor. But I think it colorfully demonstrates the challenge. So I do look at the idea first. And what I, when you say the idea, what I actually hear is business model. Right? I want to know that there is some mechanism by which you will be able to sustainably create a surplus from revenue that will cover the cost of running your operation in due course. So that's part one. Having said that, I spend most of my time interrogating the team and how they're going to do it. Because the fact of the matter is, what I really want to hear is a few things. I want to hear that the idea has legs. I want to hear that there's a model that can generate a surplus. I want to know who the customer is and why they're going to buy and how you know that. And then once I can see that there's a basic business principles in place, I then will look at what I would call execution risk. Do you have the right people to do it? Do you have the right resources? If you had financing, would that be the only thing left to do to get the business going? What I really hate is when I say to somebody, all right, if I give you the money, what's the first thing you're going to do? And they say something along the lines, I'm going to figure out what to do next. I don't want to hear that. What I want to hear is that it's the money that's holding them up, not all the other to-dos. So if, for example, as is frequently the case, you call, somebody comes to me and they say, we're going to do this, and I'm doing this by myself, then I'll say, well, who are the, ne who are the other people you're going to need to make this successful, because clearly it'll take a team. If they not only can't tell me who they're going to need next, but more critically, they don't tell me that they've already lined up and identified the people who are just waiting for me to put the money in, then they have fallen short of my expectations. I want everything possible done before I put in the money, so when the money goes in, it breaks free the business to then go on and succeed, if that makes sense. Um, Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Cool. In that case, next up is Matthew. All right. Um, I have a question around uh, showing success in a in your project, or um, what what are you supposed to advertise to someone in a pitch uh, that your social business will achieve? Um, should you focus on things like 
uh, social outcomes, which are kind of a bit um, vague at the best, and or or should we try and sort of quantify everything? Like uh, in in our fund, uh, someone donates to us and we invest that money and then pass the money on to charity. So we we turn a one dollar donation into a one dollar thirty donation um, and get a sort of percentage return each year or something like that. Um, so sh how much should we focus on? Uh, specifying these returns, even if they're not strictly financial returns? Well, I think all social enterprises have non-financial return metrics that they're going to have to come to grips with. And the measurement of social mm -hmm. outcomes is one of the hardest things people do. But I think it is a cop-out to make the measurable important rather than making the important measurable. Right? So what people will do is they'll run around going, well, we can measure this, therefore that's what we measure. That simply doesn't solve the problem. I'll give you an example in my own case. School for Startups is a social enterprise. And so we both seek to make a surplus, which is easy to demonstrate, but we have our own version of what we're trying to accomplish. So our social purpose is to help people start businesses, kind of like it says in the tin. So what we measure is the number of people that go through, so that's an output measure, i.e. the number of people we teach. But then we measure the number of businesses that were created, and then we try to measure, and this is where it starts to get harder, how long those businesses have survived for, and then we compare that against the normal survival rates of startups in the same places if we hadn't been there, and if there's no difference, then one could reasonably say, we have not done much, have we? <laughs> and so we look for improvement over what would happen in our absence, generally referred to as EVA or economic value add. Right? And that negative measure, the what would happen if we hadn't been there measure, is the way you frequently have to measure more uh, awkward uh, social outcomes. But I do believe that every social enterprise has a proactive obligation to make an attempt to quantitate, quantitatively measure true outcomes from their work. And even if it's only partial data, they need to sketch in as much as can be sketched. Because I think to do less is not to do justice to the purpose of the social enterprise. Thanks. Which means, in your case, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> right. The next person up is who's up? Uh, Tadiso. There you go. Um, uh, <clears throat> I'll just provide a quick context in that there are a lot of social movements uh, in South Africa, and the biggest, biggest problem, which is my question really, is how do you differentiate yourself uh, from other social enterprises in, in order to attract an investor? Um, you realize I, you could ask that question of how do you differentiate yourself if you're just a startup trying to attract an investor, because the answer is the same. Investors invest for two reasons. They invest to make a return, and they invest to make a difference. And that's true whether it's a social enterprise or not. If somebody, well, actually, no, that's not fair. I'd say there's a third reason that's quite common, and that's you invest because you like the entrepreneur. And in fairness, that happens a lot, especially at angel investment level. Somebody comes to me, and I think they're cool. I'm more likely to invest in them, and if they come to me, and I think they're awkward. <laughs> um, I was going to say something worse. We'll stick with awkward. Um, <laughs> But you, you can appreciate, especially at the angel level, that's actually, a, you know, the chemistry, the dynamic between you and the person is actually a very real thing, and I don't mean to ignore it. But in terms of the question you asked, Tadiso, I think you've got to simply be more appealing in two ways than others. You have to be more appealing in that you have to show that a dollar spent with you takes the world a lot further than a dollar spent with someone else. Full stop. The more you accomplished with the money given, the more attractive you are. And I'm looking, I look for people who break new ground, right? In a social enterprise, there's two ways to break ground. One is to solve a problem that hasn't been solved before. The other is to solve a problem that is currently being solved and do a better job of it. In either instance, in the former instance, it's not so much showing how your dollar is more effectively used, but it's showing that you can solve the problem at all. In the f latter case, where you're trying to improve over others, it is a case of efficiency. There's lots of people who are trying to bring purified water or clean water to small villages in dirty places. Some people use wheelbarrows, some people use wells, some people use filters. You can really compare different social efforts to provide clean water. And you can make it quantitative. And I would expect it to be quantitative in that particular area. So whatever area you're in, 
first make it, going back to Matthew's point, first measure it, second measure it as well as you can, and third, once you've measured it, you better measure up better than everybody else. So aside from doing perfectly and doing it right, it's, not, it's no hassle at all. <laughs> I think we are back to Catherine, maybe? I didn't yes. miss anyone, did I? No. Yeah. Okay, so... Um, just a bit of context. Politic is a web-based um, uh, startup that we're working on, and it has a civil and social mission, which makes it very difficult to uh, distinguish either as a startup or as a social enterprise. <laughs> and at this point, we are um, we're just we've just launched the third version of our site, but we feel that we need a lot of, to expand our team to get more uh, people with technical background and to get writers and researchers. And so my question is, do you, what are the, um, I guess, what are the advantages of going, uh, going forward as a full-fledged startup or just a full-fledged social enterprise? And do, would, what do you think would be the best way to, um, I guess, source for investments? Should we look into crowdfunding? Should we look for foundations? Should we just look for an equity firm, a private equity firm, or, I guess, yeah. I don't know if that That's makes fine. sense. But <laughs> <laughs> Almost. Um, let me ask you some questions, Catherine. Okay. <laughs> um, it, it's called politic.com. Is that what it's called? Yes. So how do you guys make money? Well, well we've not said it making money, but that's where how we want to go. How do you intend to make money? Tend to make money. <laughs> so we, we want to provide, first we want to provide a free service for politicians to have their profiles online, uh, put their policies online, their biographical information online, and have the public come and see who the politicians are if they want to vote for them. But then on the second level, we want to offer a platform for politicians to campaign. Um, and I guess I can't really go into all the details, but at the end of the day, we want to offer all the features that the public might need to interact with, with their politicians and all the features that a politician might need to interact with the public. Okay, so Catherine, here's the thing. Even though you're intending to be a social enterprise, you first and foremost have to be an enterprise. And therefore, okay. there, if, let me see if I can just recapitulate back to you what I understand what I don't understand. What I understand is that <laughs> the problem that you're trying to solve is that there is information asymmetry in politics, and a lot of people vote for a lot of people not really knowing what they stand for. And yep. that you're trying to put voters in a more informed position so that they can know what someone stands for so they can make a more informed choice. Would that be a yes. fair statement? Yes. All right. So that's the problem, social problem that you seek to solve. But now what's the business problem you're solving? Who's the customer and who um, are you charging? And on the other side, we have politicians who don't have a seamless way of interacting with their politicians, with the, with the public. They have to use Facebook, Twitter, um, to get to each and every, or SMS, and they don't really have a way to do that on one platform, and they don't have a way to know what their, um, the public is thinking. Um, if I care about water, I cannot tell my politician unless I find them on Facebook or I find them on Twitter, and it's not really a seamless way to do that. So my, our first um, customers will be politicians who want to have a way to do this in, on one platform. And, yeah, there are a lot of other things that I could tell you, <laughs> uh, probably in private, but, yeah. Okay, so I'm, gonna, I'm not going to worry about the fact that you're paranoid. Um, <laughs> don't want to tell me stuff in the middle of a, you know, very private but global hangout. Um, <laughs> interestingly enough, a number of questions come to mind. So if a okay. politician is a customer... You know, leave, I'm going to leave aside the, the challenge and just start with the basics. So what you're doing is a very classic web business model where you gather up an audience and then you try to charge for access to that audience. Perfectly legitimate model. So <laughs> what you're essentially asserting is you're going to put information about politicians up. This will hopefully gather up potential voters who will come to the site. And then once you have an audience of voters who you are regularly working with, the politicians will want to reach those voters, which I agree and you want to charge the politicians for access to those voters. Would that be a synopsis of your business model? Um, kind of. Uh, it, it sounds, yes, kind of. But um, it will probably be to charge them just because we wouldn't have, we would need to have a very big team to do exactly what we want to do. 
but yes. Okay, I didn't understand that. The reason <laughs> the reason I bring this up is, I mean, I'm. The reason I bring this up is because when you say where should I go, should we go for to Kickstarter or should we go to a private equity firm? Well, first, you don't mean private equity; you mean venture capital. Um, the difference being that a private equity firm does buyouts and takeovers; a venture capital yeah. firm does investments. But yeah. you're, you're not going to get a traditional venture capital firm to invest in you unless you can show them that you're going to become a very fast-growing, very po very profitable business. There, a so even a social venture firm, and there's a few in the U.S. and the U.K., would still want to see that you had a business model that made a lot of sense. It's not clear right now that your business model is necessarily that pulled together. I think you've probably got some experimentation to go through in business models to get to the point where an institutional investor would be interested. So you need to look to other forms. So I actually would encourage you to do something like a Kickstarter or Indiegogo okay. campaign because I think in a crowd, and that's crowd gifting, that's not even crowd funding, right? What you need to understand in Kickstarter and Indiegogo, I mean, I, well, actually, I won't presume anything, but those of you who are unfamiliar with those sites, Kickstarter and Indiegogo are the two most popular sites for people to essentially contribute money to something that they want to see successful. But you, as the person who's putting up the request for money on these sites, can choose to give them something in return. It just wouldn't be ownership in the business. So you could choose to give people access. So some people have done some quite amazing money raisings on these things for new product development, promising people access to the product, like a watch or something else, once the money had been raised. So there are ways in which you can gift back to people a reward for funding a Kickstarter Indiegogo campaign. I certainly think in your case, Catherine, given the fact that you're there's a whole community of people who would want to see you succeed, myself included. I think that there is a reasonable potential that you guys could get a certain amount of money through that kind of crowd gifting or crowdfunding okay. site. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And I want to know why you're so worried about telling me the details of your business plan. What is it about it your word's going to happen? You think I'm going to steal it? No, no, it's not that. <laughs> no, I, I definitely will send you the business plan. As soon no, no, as no, but why, don't you, why wouldn't you want to tell everybody? Uh, why? Because I'm not, uh, because I guess I haven't um, done it before. And I, I, that's, that's exactly why my question was, if you're a fully-fledged startup, should you go on the route of crowdfunding or should you just look for venture capital, capitalist or venture, like angel funding? Um, or, I, I mean, would, I, I guess I would look for mm -hmm. angels, and I would look for crowdfunding. I think okay. you're much too early for venture funding. Yeah. Cool, Clara, you're up. Hey, yeah. Um, this might sound awkward, but <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but um, I'm gonna ask um, anyway. What um, what networks do you? What sort of uh, communication methods do you use? Do you Phone a lot. I mean, do you phone a lot? Do you oh, check emails a lot? What's your way of communication? So the people who email me think I never email, read my emails. Um, but that's because the sheer number that I get overwhelms me regularly. Um, in terms of communication, like most people my age, I'm very email tied. Um, when I want to actually get something done, I pick up the phone for the simple reason that I can get much more done by simply calling them than anything else. On the other hand, my children will only text me, so I'm forced to text them back because they don't seem to have any other mode of communication, and I'm way too boring to bother with Facebook. Um, so, so I have a Facebook account. I just always forget to look at it. Um, in terms of communicating messages outbound, I do mm -hmm. Twitter a lot just because Twitter is a really, God, that it's efficient, isn't it? But yeah. what I don't tell people is I hook, well, I'm about to tell people, is I hook my Twitter to my LinkedIn and Facebook so it looks like I'm on LinkedIn and Facebook, but I'm not really. Oh, <laughs> we see so. now. Does that answer your question? Um, yes. I, um, and no. And no, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, yes, yes, it does. Can, can I ask a quick, uh, another quick question? No, only slow questions. Oh, <laughs> uh, um... <laughs> Um, I would, um, 
when you are looking for a startup to invest in, how how do you do that? What is your procedure for finding the right way to spend your money, so to say? Uh, ask the question differently. I'm not sure I understand. So if if you would want to, if you are an investor and you wanted to invest in a random startup, how would you how would you do this? What procedure would you take to find the right startup to invest in? Okay, so I do invest in startups. Mm -hmm. um, but the thing that it might not be obvious is I don't really go looking for them. Mm -hmm. I get thousands of people approaching me every year, and mm -hmm. I only invest in a few. But more to the point, I run school for startups. So I meet thousands more um, through my <laughs> teaching. Um, and I also run programs here in London where I basically take about 100 companies a year under my wing and coach them all through. So I don't suffer the issue of having to find anything. I've got way too many in front of me as it is. Mm -hmm. And I basically say no, of course, to 99% because I just don't have the financial wherewithal to invest mm -hmm. in a lot. But I do invest in the ones, but I invest in one at a time to a very small community. And usually it's somewhere in the family of you know, work that we do. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you a question. Why did you ask what networks and communication tools I use? Um, because we we had this random conversation with my teammates um, on how we're gonna get finances for a conference, and we I think it ran for a week on okay how what networks are we gonna use? So in the end, we just send random Twitter um, updates to say hey there's this project and. It did work, but we still didn't figure out, okay, what is the right network to reach out to the right investors? Where do you find the pool of investors? Where... So this well, you have I to asked... start by understanding there's no such thing as a pool, mm -hmm. right? We're all swimming alone. Yeah. <laughs> and we're usually mm -hmm. all in our own ponds, as far as I can tell. Um, <laughs> you need to target individuals. Mm -hmm. You need to find individuals and you need to reach them through all communication means to try to get their mm -hmm. attention. And it's, it's approaching them in multiple ways. The best way to approach anyone is through a referral. If somebody sends me an email saying, hey Doug, somebody I know sends me an email saying, hey, I'd like to introduce you to somebody, that is mm -hmm. profoundly different than somebody reaching me directly. Because yeah. essentially there's an implicit sort of validation process. Mm -hmm. So you need to ask yourself, how can, you know, it's all like this whole notion of degrees of freedom. How can you reach somebody who reaches somebody who knows someone, right? So, good luck. <laughs> right. I think it's Francisco who's up next. Is that right? Yes, sir. Um, let, me, let me make this quick because it's a kind of long question. It's not a long question, but like the background of it. So, my idea for the social startup that we're trying to work out is came up by seeing how much YouTube video bloggers uh, were making out of just making videos of, of humor or you know stupid stuff and um, so the idea was to use entertainment mixed with something useful something we can actually help people with um, and I noticed that there's a need for basic concepts for example of democracy in countries like Ecuador uh, and we want to make this multilingual but we want to we wanted to use the the means that people using to communicate today, which are social media, um, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, um, instead of you know going to other platforms and creating our own platform and making courses, uh, and the the way to make money is through the YouTube Partner Program, which you know pays you uh, because of the people watching the ads they put on the videos, um, which makes it complicated. And then um, we've also thought about creating um, paid for use. Um, Courses in Udemy or you know other platforms there is to to teach online, but we really want to reach the people that are not interested in taking a course or would not have the money to pay for it. We want to reach the people that need this information, but don't have the means to acquire it through formal education and stuff like that. So the fact that this is not the most profitable business model, and the fact that we cannot really show an investor or anybody how much we're going to be making because YouTube doesn't disclose how much they pay and it actually depends on various factors um, I, I, makes me think that this is going to 
really scare investors away. They're not going to invest in it. So should we go pro bono for free, really try to work voluntarily as much as we can until we have results and impact to show? Well, I'll tell you something. When I would worry about something else before I worried about all of that. You know, you start by saying you noticed how much money people were making, how successful some people were by putting up quite trivial nonsense on YouTube and gaining huge audiences and as a result gaining good revenue streams from YouTube. But bear in mind that's also what people want to watch. And so you have to be very, very careful when you dismiss the reason they're watching and then go on to say, and we're going to do something else because there's no reason to necessarily believe that people will watch your stuff. And so taking it in faith that you might my first challenge to you would be to go out and create engaging content and prove you can gather an audience. Because if you can gather an audience, everything will follow from that. But if you, have, can't, if you haven't yet tried to gather an audience, myself and other people would reasonably ask, why should we believe that you can? Why should we believe that you're going to create stuff and that people are going to want to watch and then do watch? But if you can prove that, I think you'll find it actually not that hard to gain the intention of investors and others. Yeah, that, that, that's a really good answer. <laughs> I'm glad you like it. Right. Uh, Matthew, Matt. Yep, okay. Um, I have a uh, yeah, random idea, and I want to see what, what you think about it. <laughs> okay. And um, basically, you, you mentioned the social impact bonds or social benefit bonds, as they're called in Australia. As a as a source of funding, um, and um, what, what do you think of extending that idea to to social businesses or social business franchises, where you can design a, a franchise for a social business that people can uh, sort of pick up, which is credit worthy because the finances uh, the franchise is designed well and then pull loans to all these companies together and uh, have investors invest in this pool of loans similar to how they do with social impact bonds. Um, so what do you think of that, that sort of uh, uh, extension of social impact bonds towards the business side, towards the, pri uh, the sort of for-profit side on that sort of charity to for-profit continuum? Do social benefit bonds in Australia provide a return of capital and more than capital? Uh, yeah. Oh, they, they, they can, yeah. So if you, uh, if you have a, a service which stops people going to jail, and in this community uh, a lot of people go to jail, and you can prove that you lowered the rate of people going to jail, um, then the government uh, gives you a... Uh, the government doesn't have to pay for all these uh, people while they're in jail, so they end up giving you a, uh, a, some money, and then that can go to your investors who uh, okay. who gave you debt investments and stuff like that. All right, so it sounds quite similar to the ones I'm familiar with. Uh, so the answer is, I think it's fine if you can pull it off, because what you're now doing is you're trying to turn a bond into an equity vehicle, though, and that's that's the issue is less that you're applying it to private activity than you are of trying to apply debt to what's normally an equity kind of activity. And the challenge there is are people are going to be content with the upside of debt as compared to the upside of equity? And they may or may not be. Um, I think the same rules apply in social investing as apply in normal investing. You want to match the risk and reward even if it's at a discount. Does that make some sense? Yeah. yeah. So, um... Are you going to do and, it? Um, yeah, I'm thinking of um, doing it with the World Economic Forum uh, community, the Global Shapers. So and, what kind um, of franchises would you be back. creating? <laughs> um, so, yeah, the idea is to make franchises across a whole supply chain. So it's like vertically integrated small businesses. Um, Give me an so example. So you can, you can have a very simple one, which is a farm that sells fruit. And um, that's a one company... Um, sort of uh, one, one company uh, supply chain. But if you have a farm um, and then there's a stall and then there's a, a, a transport company which transports the fruit from the farm to the stall to be sold, um, 
then you can uh, have a three company supply chain and if all of them uh, are designed in a way which are um, you know a, a special set of techniques to uh, to to grow things kind of like um, I don't know, like open source bee farms or something like that that they have um, online, something like that. Um, and they're designed in a way which people can kind of pick up the model of the business and run it using the manuals. And um, and it has a stable cash flow because there's a demand for it that's been researched carefully. Um, yeah, then you can have lots of lots of different kinds of businesses like this. And um, yeah, and then uh, sort of uh, have have a have a sort of university course or some sort of course where people go through and they learn about the business uh, in turn for free and when they graduate they get a loan and a business. Hmm. Well, it's a business in a box idea, isn't it? Um, yeah. I like the idea of putting complementary businesses together into a supply chain so that you end up with all the pieces necessary to reach market. And some of the stuff we were doing in Nigeria it had some similarity to that where we would help couple together the starting of the business, like a chicken farm, with the distribution into, into local market stalls, et cetera, et cetera. And we would be funding all three entities contemporaneously. Yeah, there wasn't social businesses, but I, we were executing a social purpose by supporting you know, the entrepreneurship trail. Uh, what's interesting to me is you do frequently have to do that. You can't just support one business, especially in an emerging economy. You have to support a whole series of businesses around each other in order to get the whole thing to sort of kick off in a good way. So I, I support that. It's not clear to me at all whether your social bonds will work to support it, though. That yeah. is a, kind of a sort of a big old open question. Let me know how it goes. Yeah, thanks. I think it's Tadisu up next. Yeah, um, just before I actually ask my question, you said there were two things, so I'm waiting for the second thing. Um, what, what do you mean there's two things? Uh, you said there were two things about how you set yourself apart for investors. And you Did said I? I lied. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll scratch that all. Uh, the other thing is, uh, I'll actually take this opportunity quickly to uh, ask two things if I can sneak them in. One is, um, once you've actually re received the funding at a very basic level, like as a startup, how do you actually optimize and expand in the market so that you attract more investors? Um, and then the other second thing is, um, when you have created an innovation, which is something that I've created now, uh, which quickly is like an early warning a system for HIV and STD detecting in a person's body, uh, the, the stage I'm at right now is requiring funding for the research of the actual product and the chemistry and, and, and I've assembled t a team uh, of world-renowned scientists, uh, especially from South Africa that it is, uh, that, will act, that have committed to the actual project. But how do I attract investors to invest in basically research? All right, well, let me answer the second question first, and we'll try to go back to the first. Um, it is actually hugely challenging to get investors to invest in research. There's, very, there's no country in the world where they do. It's too early in the food chain. Research is invested in by governments, by universities, by research councils, by foundations, but research Investors don't invest in research. Investors invest in things that they, in products and services that are ready to go to market or need some development, but are not. You're not asking the question, does it work? You're asking the question, how do I build it and scale it? So as a rule, you don't get money for research. Not, no matter how worthy. Not from an investor. Those that kind of money comes from other parties. Now there are gaps in that food chain, right? So there's usually lots of money for desk research and pure research, there's very little money in most, of the, in most places in the world, including the UK, for bringing research into commercial entities. So that gap between the research desk and the commercial business. So in various countries, there are various institutions that have arisen to deal with that, the gap of what I would call uh, from research to development. Uh, in the UK, it's the Technology Strategy Board. In the US, it's DARPA. In uh, Germany, it's the Fraunhofer Institutes, and you know, in each country, you've got these entities that are supposed to deal with that gap. You probably don't have one in South Africa, would be my guess. Um, so that's your first challenge. Um, the sec the first question you asked me, I didn't understand. So you'll have to take another stab at it. Okay, so what I mean is, once you've 
actually attracted in, in, investors, but you want to attract more investors. Um, how do you do that? How do you grow in that market? Because I'm assuming that in order to attract more investors, you need to show them that you that what you're doing is actually working, and that you just require more funding for there to be a bigger impact. So what you need to do is start thinking of investment not as a continual line, but as a series of steps that you take. So when you get investment, that investment is supposed to carry you, your business to the point where it's then worth more, right? And the way in which it's worth more is it accomplishes something. It creates the product, it creates IP, or it gets to market, but it has to uh, overcome milestones that both reduce the risk and thus increase the value of the business and accomplish something that shows that you're at a later stage of business. And you have to know what distance you're going to go and then you have to accomplish that distance with the money you've been given so that future investors when they look at you say, okay, you received 300,000 pounds and with that 300,000 pounds you've accomplished the following things that have made your business more worth, worth more, thus you're in a position to sell more of the business at a higher value and at a lower dilution costs to you. Does that help? Sounds good. That sounds yeah. very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Piece of cake, right? <laughs> yeah. So I have time for one more question. Who's got one? All right, Catherine, oh. you win. You stick your hand up. <laughs> um, so my first question is actually a favorite. Um, I've just finished my business plan for Politic.com and I'd really like if you could look at it. And <laughs> is that your question? <laughs> no, 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 that's not my question. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, yeah, if you'd be open to looking at it, that would be great. Um, my second question is about teams. Um, so we're just about, we, we really want to grow a team. I have, it's, I'm one of the co-founders, I have a technical person, and we, we want to start looking for crowdfunding, angel investors, venture capitalists, and my question is about who, who is in the team. Um, I'm pretty, I'm 23, so I think, I might be pretty young, and I feel that they m I might need to uh, find someone who probably has an MBA uh, to do the business side, and I already have someone who, who's a technical person. So do you really think there's need to have people who are more mature in a team to look more um, legitimate, I guess? Um, I actually I don't think you do, no. I okay. think that that's largely your own uncertainties playing themselves out, um, <laughs> to be blunt. Uh, I think that it is not complex to build a business plan. You know what you want to do. You know the business. I think what you can do is get mentors or advisors or people to look over your shoulder and give you critical feedback before okay. you present it to angels. I also think you should be quite aware of the fact that when you start presenting to angel investors, you may find you present to a lot of them before you get one to say yes. You'd be amazed at how quickly you're going to learn what to say and what not to say. It's a bit of a crucible through fire sort of thing, right? So the learning experience, but nobody wants to hear from somebody who isn't the founder. Everybody wants to hear from the founder. Nobody wants to be fobbed off on some other third party who stands up. So they're all going to want to hear you. So you've got no choice. You are the voice of your business. You know. So it's going to be you they want to hear. And if you feel that there's skills you don't have to support you, you need to bring in other people. But if you feel that you can pull together the passion, the mission, the layout of what you intend to do and make a case for it, then I would start there, you and your technical cohort, and see how far you can get. Okay. Now, as for your other question, send it to me. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Will do. <laughs> I'm sure you will. Um, <laughs> right, guys, we've run out of time. Somehow your questions occupied an hour. How funny is that? Uh, so all it leaves me to do is to thank all five of you. Thank you very much. I think it was really nice of you, especially Matt. It must be awfully late in Australia. Yes, yeah, three in the morning. <laughs> well done, you. Thank you for getting up at such an odd hour. Um, and guys, hopefully I'll see some of you in Johannesburg. For the ones I won't, hopefully we'll see you on more Hangouts. But thank you very much, and I'll be back in a couple of weeks. Bye.